Well, hello and welcome to Rare Classic Cars and another porch chat here. So I posted a video not that long ago about uh, worst GM engines of all time, as well as best GM engines of all time. And it surprisingly got uh, rave reviews. I have to admit, I was not expecting that. So I'll continue this series as the weather remains cold in the Midwest. And if you're new to the channel, those videos brought in quite a few new viewers. Welcome to Rare Classic Cars, which is, I like to say, the home for people who like to understand the nitty gritty about vehicles that you don't really see anymore. So not the Corvettes and the Challengers and the Mustangs and the Camaros, but it's really a channel to celebrate the everyday cars of yesteryear that are now virtually extinct. So take a look at some of the car reviews as well on here, in addition to these porch chats, which I started doing in the winter time because I can't do car reviews with salt on the roads. In any case, in this episode, we're gonna talk about GM's worst transmissions. Now, General Motors made a number of excellent, excellent transmissions. And I, I would say more than the other domestics, the execution for GM has more of a wide distribution in terms of how their ideas panned out into reality. So they have some really excellently executed items and then they have some that let's just say are not so well executed and I would say my favorite transmission of all time which I will reserve for a separate video is a particular version of one GM transmission and that said there are a number of transmissions that GM came out with over time that at least in my mind, and again, this is my opinion only, really just aren't up to par, especially when you stack it up against the excellent offerings that they made for so many years. You know, the Turbo Hydromatic 300, uh, 350s, 375s, 400s, 425s. Uh, those are all great and hard to beat. We can even say 700 R4s, you know, things like that a bit later. So most of this is focused on, I would say, my list as it pertains to older vehicles. Let's call it 1950s through somewhat modern day. But there's a special mention that I'll make of a modern day GM transmission on here too. In any event, what is my list of worst GM transmissions of all time? There it is. And again, not quite in ranked order. It's hard to rank worst things. I just put the numbers there so we can talk about it in different orders. So let's start with the Roto Hydromatic, otherwise known as the Slim Jim Hydromatic. This transmission came out in 1961. It was used from 1961 to 64 on all the full-size Oldsmobiles. So whether you had a Starfire, a 98, an 88, didn't matter. It was used in all of them. Also the F85s and Cutlasses, uh, albeit there were different versions of it. And it was developed by Oldsmobile. It was also used in the long wheelbase Pontiacs, uh, sorry, the short wheelbase Pontiacs, so the Catalinas, uh, the Ventura trim on the Catalinas, and even the Grand Prix had this transmission as well. The Bonnevilles and the Star Chiefs uh, did not. They continued with the old Hydromatic. So, came out in 1964, engineered by Oldsmobile, had three gear, three speeds, let's call it, although Oldsmobile kind of marketed it as a four speed in some literature because it had a stator in the fluid coupling which would multiply uh, the torque at different ratios depending upon the engine speed uh, versus the wheel speed. So uh, I'll call it a three range transmission. And there's a number of problems, but mostly two things, the drivability and the reliability of this transmission are just way, way below what GM was putting out at the time. You know, this is a time when GM had the old Hydromatic that was used in everything from army tanks to vehicles. And uh, later that was superseded by the Turbo Hydromatic, which was also, you know, great transmission. This Slim Jim Rota Hydromatic was a smaller, lighter weight, and uh, it has a couple issues. One is from a drivability standpoint, it's not like the later turbo hydromatics that have uh, torque converters. It has a fluid coupling. And the one to two shift is, I'll call it interesting in particular. So not only is it executing a shift, but this transmission goes into, in effect, full mechanical lockup once it's in second gear. So the fluid coupling drains, it's fully mechanically locked. 
And during that one to two shift, you not only have the shift being executed, but the lockup of the transmission all at the same time. And that leads to a lot of clunkiness and lurching and bucking, even if these things are adjusted correctly. Um, the old Hydromatic had a bit of this issue, not as severe, on the two to three shift. That was a four range transmission. This was a three range. But this one to two shift, if you've driven these cars, you'll just notice it's, it is really, really bad. And beyond that, the fluid pressures that are internal to the transmission are generally higher than what is used in other transmissions. So if you have like a turbo hydromatic, a later turbo hydromatic, there's not this draining of a fluid coupling and a lockup that's occurring uh, in one of those when it goes from one to two to, you know, to three. It does happen on this roto hydromatic. And I guess the upside is that it's an efficient transmission. You have full mechanical lockup. So this is what it took many years for the domestics to really go back to this uh, until the late 70s to have lockup transmissions, albeit that was done with torque converters and those in the torque converter locking up. But it's efficient, but not reliable and not smooth. And I would just say I love 1961 Oldsmobiles in particular. I think the design is fabulous. but. And 62s are great looking as well, and 63s are great looking to my, at least to my eye. But I just don't want one of these rotohydromatic transmissions. I can't even imagine it behind a Starfire engine uh, with all that power. These transmissions failed at a regularly high interval. And the problem now is finding anybody who's going to touch it. Um, who will touch I don't do any automatic transmission repair. I don't consider myself qualified to do that. And I don't know of somebody who's going to, to touch these today. So if, by the way, you want to help out your fellow car lover and you know somebody who does in your area or you yourself touch them, put a comment uh, in the comment box to let people know that you enjoy uh, forms of torture. Second on the list, the 440T4 transmission. So this was a transmission, uh, the first of GM's front-wheel drive transverse four-speed uh, transmissions. And it came out in the 1985 C-bodies, the DeVilles, the Electras, uh, and the Olds 98. And the program, you know this is bad when the car program, the release of the C-bodies was delayed because of transmission problems. And they failed at very regular rates. Like I said, it was the first effort in terms of the front wheel drive, transversely mounted, four speed, you know, full size car. Uh, and they just did not have great durability. Beyond that, they were quite clunky in terms of how they shifted. So they do lock up in third gear, not fourth gear. And they had problems with the, uh, the lock up being smooth and uh, shifting in and out of lock up. They also had challenges with the lockup solenoids, which I'll get uh, to later because that seems to have been a pervasive problem across some of the GM transmissions of the era. They had uh, two to one downshift clunks. They didn't upshift or downshift particularly smoothly. And it is, it is, I believe, the first GM transmission to use both a throttle valve cable and a modulator valve. So most transmissions have one or the other, or in the case of like a Chrysler torque flight, they have a shift rod that goes to the transmission or series of linkages. But this had both, and the, thro the thought was the, the throttle valve cable or the TV cable would control the shift points. And that's a little cable that moves in and out as you open and close the throttle, and that basically tells the transmission how much throttle you're commanding and when to upshift and downshift. And then the modulator valve on these would control the shift harshness and, or smoothness. Uh, most transmissions, like a turbo hydromatic 400, just have the modulator valve. There's no throttle valve cable. The turbo hydromatic 350s have a throttle valve cable. Um, so it was always kind of one or the other, but this transmission had both. In any event, it, it just is clunky. And you have to be careful if you have one of these cars. I've owned many C bodies from the 1985 and 1986 model year, and I can just tell you the transmissions are not robust. So don't hot rod them. Now, once you get to about 1987, 1988, <clears throat> the internals were starting to get fixed. And later, this 440T4 evolved into the 4T60E, which 
I think it's hard to argue. It's, it's one of GM's best automatics of all time, certainly of the front wheel drive automatics. Smooth, reliable. So they really perfected it over its life cycle. I would say, you know, by 1988 model year, certainly by 1989 and 90, this transmission was, was really quite reliable and, and pretty bulletproof. But in 1985, 1986, the early model years, especially 1985, especially they did have early versions of the C bodies that came out uh, in around April of 1984. So if you get one of those, that's really problematic. I've owned many cars with this transmission. I still have a car with it. I have not had any problems. I've put 130, 140,000 miles on some of them, but I'm very conscious of how I'm driving, which is not how the average customer is. So when the transmission, as an example, goes into lockup at third gear, I tend to just let off on the gas pedal a little bit just to reduce the stress on the transmission. Um, I also just don't hot rod it. I had a 1985 Cadillac Coupe de Ville that I owned for probably eight years. It was my daily driver. I put 70,000 miles on it. I bought it with 25,000 miles and I bought it with a transmission wine. It had a wine in it. And I thought, well, I paid nothing for the car. It was, like I said, a 20,000 mile car. And I think I paid $800 for it. It was in perfect cosmetic shape. It also had some running issues. And I didn't know it had a transmission whine until I got the motor running. Then I found that the transmission was whining. I thought, uh oh, here, this is great. Here I fixed the motor, it runs perfect. I'm going to have a transmission problem. I drove that car for all that time with the transmission whine, and it never got any worse. It never got any better. I changed the fluid, I changed the filter, I did everything to try to get rid of it. It was a torque converter whine. It never went away, but it never got worse, and it lasted me for a long time. It was just, it was just the character of the car. I didn't care for $800. It shifted. So the 440T4 was number two. And again, it evolved into a very, very reliable, robust transmission, but it did not start life that way. I've also heard that part of the issue here was that GM, remember GM in the early 80s was going through a lot of restructuring and the high dramatic division in particular laid off a lot of people and, a lot, and retired a lot of people, uh, a lot of whom had the know-how from the previous years of how to build good transmissions. And some of that know-how went out the door and this transmission went out the door maybe not as as well as uh, robust as originally intended third the turbo hydromatic 200 and 200 c not the 200 r4 the 200 and 200 c so this was first used behind chevettes and it later went into everything like even to the full-size cars if you had a full-size impala with a, a 305 or you had bless your heart a car with the 350 olds diesel even that was the biggest engine it was behind, a 350 cubic inch motor. So imagine you take a transmission from a Chevette and you put it in a full-size car with a torquey, we won't necessarily say powerful, but a torquey V8 engine. And consequently, you know, if a lot of people remember, people used their cars as tow vehicles back then. Uh, it was the SUV of the day. And you throw a trailer behind a, a car with that transmission and a boat or something that's of any weight, not going to work. Beyond that, I would say the 200s, they just don't shift very smoothly. They were a, a lighter weight version of the 350. They had different internal components. And they're not as smooth shifting. They're kind of rough by the standards. They, the Ford fans are going to love me for this. They shift like a C6 or a C4 or an FMX, which uh, if you're a GM transmission lover of the time, you'll know what I mean. I mean, 350s and 400 transmissions for GM just glide in and out of gear, very smoothly, imperceptible, uh, a thing of beauty. And I, I, it's not that I don't like the Ford transmissions. They actually are, are great units, but their shifts are perceptible by far, even back to the old cruise matics uh, it's just a different philosophy in the transmission. So these don't shift that smoothly. They're not reliable. They're not robust. Now, when, when GM came out with the 200R4 in 1981, they had fixed a lot of the internal issues associated with this, and they did make updates over time. I guess it begs the question of why did GM put these in full-size cars as well? Remember, fuel economy standards, trying to save weight. 
but not a good transmission, not reliable, not smooth. And again, I have, I have a car with this, uh, this transmission now, and I've owned multiple cars with these transmissions, including a Cadillac Seville diesel with one. And I, I've never had any problems, but you have to go into the ownership experience, understanding that this is not a robust piece of machinery. And if you just drive it normally and you enjoy it, you're going to be, I would say, generally fine. If you're somebody who's got a lead foot, you have to pass everybody the stoplight. First of all, I guess if you're driving a Cadillac Seville diesel, you're not passing, you're not drag racing anybody successfully. So, um, but I would just be careful. Keep your fluid changed. Keep the filter changed uh, if you can. And you should be all right if it's a lower mileage car. Last, I have the modern GM 8-speed automatic. I did read that there was recently a class action lawsuit filed against uh, GM for, I think, 2014 to 19 model year 8-speed automatics. Or it might have been 15 to 19. In any case, these transmissions, I've had them in vehicles. They are bucking, lurching. It almost feels like in some cases when you come to a stop, you're getting rear-ended. That's how bad it is. I looked back, I had a 2017 Silverado with one, and it was a very pleasant truck. Great 6.2 liter V8. Uh, I would say very quiet, very refined truck. I loved everything about it, but that transmission was abysmal. And other people obviously had problems with them too because of the class action lawsuits. I, don't, I can't speak to the durability of them. I don't know if the durability is good or bad. I can just say the drivability is very poor. Now, my, my current Silverado, my 2021, also has an 8-speed, and it's fine. And I've read in the literature that a big part of this issue with the 8-speeds was not so much the design as it was apparently the fluid that was used. And sometimes if you flush the fluid with the updated uh, fluid, it's, it's much better. I can't speak to that. I can only say that from the factory, I had two of these trucks, and both of them were, were really, really poor shifters. Upshifts, downshifts, terribly clunky. Uh, terrible, terrible. Uh, by far, even I would say the worst of the whole list in terms of shift quality. I've never experienced a transmission that bad. And it was a real, it was a real shame because otherwise the truck was was just pleasant. Now it may be the case that, like I said, the the TSBs seem to suggest that you change the fluid and that fixes it. I can't speak to that. But as it came from the factory, those were not my favorite. And lastly, I just put a little honorable mention. This isn't a transmission, but I put the torque converter clutch, TCC lockup solenoids on here for GM. If you have a car from the early years, you know, let's say up to 1990-ish in particular, the lockup solenoids on these GM cars, I guess even after that, probably through the mid-90s on some of them, they tend to stick. And so the symptom that you have is, only after you've been driving for a while and the motor's hot, particularly after you come off the freeway or you've been driving an extended period of time where the transmission has been coupled together for, for some time and it's warm, you'll find that when you come to stop the motor stalls, you put it in neutral, you'll restart it, starts right back up, you put it in drive, it stalls again. You wait about 10 minutes, start it up, you can put it in drive, you can drive away and it's fine. What happens is the torque converter lockup solenoid sticks, so in effect, the engine and the drive wheels are not decoupling. So when you come to a stop, it's basically having a manual transmission car with the clutch out. Uh, and for whatever reason on these early GM cars that had the lockup converters, they tend to stick, even stuck back then, but especially they stick now. Often it's not a bad job to replace, although <coughs> on this transmission, the Turbo Hydromatic 200, among other challenges with it, to replace the lockup solenoid is a transmission out job. On some of the other GM transmissions, it's not. It's actually pretty easy. You remove, like on the front wheel drives, the side cover, and you can get to it pretty easily. On some of the other GM transmissions, like the 325s, you drop the pan, you can get to it easily. That 200 seems to be the one where it's the most challenging, arguably. Now, you can also, if you just you want to keep driving the car and you don't have, often the repair on the easier ones is probably four or $500. Uh, 
If you don't have the four or five hundred dollars to spend, you can just unhook the connector on the transmission. On the front wheel drive cars, if you pop the hood, you look down right at the, on the driver's side on the front of the transmission, you'll see a little connector that goes right into the front of it. Just unhook it. Or on the rear wheel drives, you'll see generally on the driver's side a connector that goes into the transmission there. You can unhook it. And that just disables the lockup. So you're going to get about 5 to 10% worse mileage on the freeway. But, you know, again, if you don't have the money to repair it, that's one way to do it. You're not going to hurt the transmission. Yeah, you won't get the same gas mileage. Uh, the check engine light may come on, particularly at freeway speeds. But you're not hurting anything. And you could drive it like that indefinitely until you, you want to get it repaired if you ever do. So I just thought I'd offer that tip for everyone. In any case, let me know how you like this video on GM's worst transmissions. We will get to the other OEs shortly. Thanks again for watching and check out the other videos, including the car reviews below and other ports chats. If you haven't seen the one on worst GM engine transmissions, as well as the best GM engines and transmissions, because GM made a lot of great ones. And I also have a video currently posted of Chrysler's worst engines. I'll get to the best and worst of all the OEs as we continue along. Thanks again for watching. Take care. Thanks again for watching this video on GM's worst transmissions. More videos coming of the best and worst from various OEs on a number of topics. It seems that my viewers appreciate this and it's bringing in new viewers as well. So if you're new to the channel, welcome. Check out some of the other videos. And if you're not and you're a recurring viewer, thanks again for watching. Take care.